The following is a conversation with Chris Hellman, Principal Program Manager for Developer Tools at Microsoft. Chris has an extensive background in web development stemming from the late 90s, and he's a driving force in the open source community today. Chris has worked on many open source projects for companies like Yahoo, Mozilla, and Microsoft. Chris's passion for helping others through open source has touched millions of lives around the world. Welcome to Pioneers in Open Source. Chris, you have an amazing career when it comes to the world of open source, and I have so many questions for you today. Um, but before we dive into that, I know that you had a history at Mozilla. Can you kind of walk us through a brief uh, overview of your professional career, how it ta uh, ta ties into open source a little bit, and what are you doing today? I started as a web developer very early on, 1996, uh, and then I worked for a few banks and stuff and BMW and some other companies, mostly on internal stuff, because back then the internet wasn't big enough for, or actually interesting enough for people yet. Then the whole uh, enterprise-y thing kicked off and e-commerce kicked off, so I went to work for eToys in America and the UK, uh, moved to the UK as well from Germany. And um, from there on, I basically, uh, that was the first dot com crash. And then I worked for an agency and did things like visitbritain.com, tourism board of England kind of stuff, like local government things in England. And from there, when I got an offer from Yahoo, I worked at Yahoo and uh, was a lead engineer there, working on the front page of Yahoo and working on Yahoo. Um, answers back then and a few other bits and bobs and the libraries that we created and that's when I started to also do a lot of like open source stuff uh, creating the YUI library together with other people and promoting it and when I uh, hit a slump there and basically couldn't get promoted further up I actually defined the role of developer evangelist by writing the developer evangelism handbook and gave myself that name on the back end and then somebody asked me what that is and then I explained it and then I got the job which was lucky. And uh, when Yahoo uh, went belly up, I worked in in the UK. I went uh, to work for Mozilla because I've always been a huge fan of Firefox uh, in, in the past. And that was basically the big open source wonderland to work in. So I worked in on the Firefox developer tools. I worked on Firefox itself and I worked on Firefox OS, which was a very um, interesting and uh, and like daring opportunity to actually turn HTML5 into something that is like native um, applications on mobile, and a lot of the stuff that we do nowadays is based on that on that research we did back then. Although Firefox OS didn't turn out to be a success, and when uh, when Microsoft asked me to help them actually roll out a new browser to get rid of Internet Explorer, I really woke up and said like, yes, that's what I wanted to do for 20 years now and uh, joined Microsoft in 2015, first in England and then moved over to Germany like three years ago uh, because of Brexit. And now I'm the uh, I'm doing the developer tools in the Edge browser, which is an open source project, uh, Chromium based with uh, together with Chrome and uh, Google and Intel and some other companies out there, one of the biggest open source projects as well. And I work a lot with Visual Studio Code as well, which is also the yeah the biggest GitHub repo, I think, uh, the most successful GitHub open source thingy. It's just a great editor. It's fun to work with. And um, so that's where I am at the moment. So I started as a web developer, then uh, moved through the ranks as a developer, and then hit the, 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 the that glass ceiling of like not being able to be an IC and be promoted without becoming a manager. And I sidestepped that by coming up with the developer evangelism thing and defining it more detailed. I mean, they, other people defined it before, but nobody actually just wrote a handbook on it. So um, that was my career so far. And now I'm looking at the developer tools of Microsoft and we'll see what's next. And I'm, I'm very happy to be in a huge project like that that millions of people use every day. At the same time, every, we do it as open source and people can still talk to us on GitHub. So it's really fun. You have a deep-rooted history in the world of open source, far deeper than uh, a lot of the folks I I've talked to. Um, some quick backstory for the, the youngins uh, who are you know, less than 10 years in service in, in this wacky world of JavaScript, HTML, and whatnot. Um, the YUI library of circa 2005, 2006 was actually quite groundbreaking. It was um, 
the first, I would think, massive, large uh, UI framework for the browser, which um, Jack Slocum of EXEJS ended up creating extensions for, and ended up creating his own product, and, and history was written for that library. Chris, what was it like to be a part of the YUI team? I mean, you guys were setting some crazy trends. To a degree, I mean, like I wasn't part of the team itself because I was in, it wasn't in the US, I was in the UK and I was still the engineering lead on, uh, on the, the, other, like, uh, the other Yahoo products there. But it was interesting to see because, uh, I mean, we had like, uh, uh, like lots of heavyweights working for us there and Node.js started there to a degree as well. Like all the, all the ideas of like making JavaScript a server-side language and not only a client-side language came out of that environment, which is kind of hilarious because nobody ever mentions it. The interesting bit about YUI back then was that it was a uh, an, an industrial grade operate uh, 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 library. It was really well documented. It was it was obvious that it had Java background people in it because it, it had like all kind of examples. It, it had a proper architecture and the architecture was documented. And the back the big thing that we had back then was we were battling jQuery, which had a completely different approach. jQuery was like anybody can build things for the web. We make it really easy to to build things and make it clickable and animate things. So rather than having to understand what the DOM is like and having to understand how browsers work, you basically can just put click things together quite easily. And I think both of them uh, uh, made the world that we have right now. I think the YUI side of it was like I learned a lot more about the browser and about building for the web by using the library because it was so documented. Uh, but for the casual user, it was just too much. They were just overwhelmed by it. They didn't want to use it. They, they were more likely to like do just do a dollar click something in, uh, in jQuery. And jQuery was groundbreaking because it brought thousands and thousands of people into this world that would, wouldn't have looked at it because the, the, the more uh, academic approach that YUI did would not be the right thing for them and other things like Dojo and MooTools and other frameworks we had back then. I mean, at one time I wrote for, uh, I wrote for a blog and we did a comparison with like 126 different Ajax libraries, which was also fascinating because the technology of Ajax, I wrote the first JavaScript book that had actually an Ajax chapter in it. And I had to reverse engineer all of these ideas myself from a blog post by Adaptive Path back then who came up with the idea of Ajax. And um, then a lot of libraries made it easier for people to not have to understand it. Um, a lot of the stuff that jQuery did and also YUI did then uh, in, then involved uh, or like um, inspired the the, uh, the JavaScript community to actually standardize those things. So the fetch API and all the things that we can do nowadays are basically based on those lab wrapper libraries we did back then. What I found fascinating about YUI is that uh, it kind of missed the boat on like becoming a a mobile environment as well mm -hmm. like same with jQuery jQuery mobile was not quite the same thing as jQuery so it was still all the desktop stuff so the uh, the heyday or, or like how it started and how it became really useful and then kind of when the, when the mobile revolution started and everybody had an iPhone and the iPhones didn't do as well on JavaScript that the rest of the desktop did we actually kind of fell into a native world and kind of got forgotten. And I guess that's where YUI fell, uh, fell in as well. But it was an incredibly exciting time. And like the amount of talent around us was just ridiculous. I mean, the amount of people I managed to hire in uh, in the UK, I think we were a team of 14 people. And together we've written 37 books on web development. And that's just wow. the production team of the Yahoo front page in the UK. And it was uh, it was interesting to see like how how much easier it is to roll out things in the Silicon Valley when you're in the center. Like yeah. a lot of the things that we built that were technically better didn't get taken on because they weren't built in America. So they were built by somebody else. So the it was much easier to get to upper management in the Silicon Valley than from a weird European office. But it was great. It was a great time, and I mean, all the people that I met there, some of the engineers are just incredibly insightful, and it's great to see that the loud ones, the ones that actually later on became big bloggers and did their own frameworks and stuff, are one side of it. But there were like some really, really intelligent and amazingly organized people working there who just do their nine to five job and didn't want fame, didn't want to be uh, changing the world. They just want to build really cool stuff and. It was impressive to see where these people are now and how it's spread out to everywhere. So that's really fun to have this as a starting point. 
you mentioned a little earlier that you uh, worked at Mozilla, and mm -hmm. but talking about this this world where you were working at Yahoo at the time, working on uh, technical manuscripts, comparing different JavaScript frameworks and libraries. Um, when, when I talk to the developers who are relatively new in the industry, uh, I hear sometimes complaints about the differences between browsers. And what you mentioned also standardization, which today what we notice is most browsers are actually more closer aligned, especially given that things like Edge are part of the Chromium um, uh, co code base or, or a fork of it. So what was life like when you had this massive chasm between IE6 and this new browser called Firefox? Because when you were working on YUI at the time, if my memory serves properly, Firebug either had just come on the scene or was just on the horizon. So l let's talk about that world, please. Yeah, it was interesting. I mean, it, it cracks me up when people complain about browser differences these days. And I think um, just to, to, to put it up one more level, I think it all boils down to the simple fact that people think you can control the web. And people think that everything has to look the same on every device and every and every. A browser and that is just not the web this will never be a case stop chasing that dream make it work everywhere make it usable everywhere and make it great in environments that support great uh, uh, great new functionality but all the all the technology on the web is super forgiving like css if the browser doesn't know what to do with it it just doesn't show it that's fine there's there's no error message there's no no right. no uh, broken experience it's just applied as it can be applied that's not the case in JavaScript. That's where we can make mistakes and really break the experience of users. And most of the time we do it by, uh, by chasing the wrong approach of trying to make everything work the same, regardless of what browser it is. And this is native environment. This is native development. So when people nowadays complain that browser differences make a difference, uh, make, a, make a, their life art, uh, what they actually talk about is that iOS is different to the rest of the world. So most of the case, it's Safari on iOS that does do something different. And the fun bit is that everybody on iOS wants the web to do the cool new thing that Apple released a week ago and hasn't talked about it because it's not a public open source company. So we, don't, we didn't even know that functionality would come because it's a differentiator for them to have native functionality that the web doesn't have. So saying that, uh, that Safari is the new IE and holds us back feels weird because at the same time, Apple is not a company that actually just wants to do web stuff. It actually is more at home in their own hardware environment, in their own mobile environment, and their own cloud. Right. So it's kind of unfair to do that. But going back to that time, it was just, I remember I started at Netscape 3 and then Netscape 4, and then Netscape 6 was the first one to actually support DOM 1. And then mm -hmm. Firefox came out of that Netscape crash kind of thing. There's a great documentary called uh, Code Rush. Uh, which actually shows you how that company started. And uh, IE was IE4, and then IE5 and IE6. IE had JScript, not JavaScript. And uh, then Opera came around. Opera was actually the first uh, a commercial browser that I know because it had a banner in it basically showing ads. So you actually had to pay for the browser to use. And there were like uh, then these range hybrid browsers like My IE2 and the Maxton browser, which had all both rendering engines of Firefox and IE in it. Mm -hmm. So you didn't even know what to do. So yeah, thinking about before that time, it was basically, uh, we didn't have any standardized DOM. We didn't have any standardized JavaScript interface, how to interact with the page. So we had uh, the document all for Internet Explorer and we had a uh, document other things for other browsers and uh, like half imported DOM ideas already. So um, what we needed to do when we wrote JavaScript, we actually needed to detect the browser. And this is what DHTML was called, dynamic HTML, which makes no sense because HTML isn't dynamic. It's a static language. It basically renders and shows stuff. But in DHTML, you basically did a if document all, then do this JavaScript. If document uh, uh, not all, then do the other JavaScript. Document layers was the thing from Netscape. And layers were basically divs that were absolutely positioned and had an own source element. So they were kind of an iframe, but they weren't an iframe. And it was an absolute mess. So basically, you wrote the same code about three times. 
it was a great time to be a JavaScript developer because you, if you wrote yourself your own this uh, this own animation library that basically allowed you to click things and make them appear, then a lot of people paid you a lot of money for like 500 lines of JavaScript that were completely incomprehensible. But it was also playing whack-a-mole with how browsers changed and how differences in browsers were all the time. So you needed to know how something broke in different browsers. So this was our main our main. Uh, skill set it wasn't writing code it was knowing how to work around issues how to how to make things display the way they're not there css wasn't a thing either yet so you actually did table layouts and you did like uh, background colors on table elements to build lines and paint lines on the page it was all absolutely atrocious because it there was no semantics there the html was basically painting by numbers rather than like structuring the page and then doing something useful with it and this all changed when firefox came around and basically really ramped up the market and basically changed it and the standardization process that came with it also said this is how it should work and this is how internet explorer 8 and 9 and all the others after that and 7 as well already supported that kind of stuff this is also when the the uh the the libraries started to come in i remember there was the base js or the ie js by dean edwards mm -hmm which allowed you to actually include it in your products and write DOM specific code, like standardized code. And it did all the things for Internet Explorer 7 that it still worked under the hood somehow. So uh, these were incredibly well developed and well understood. Uh, uh, well, well, these people knew browsers really well. The library itself to read was absolutely atrocious. It was kind of hard to, to grasp, but people said like, okay, put this in and then it will work. And this is also what jQuery and uh, YUI and others then also told you like, okay, if you use these libraries, then you abstract it away the pain that is different browsers. And even with CSS, it was like that. We had like prefixes for Internet Explorer, for Safari, for Firefox. And Firefox only short-lived. It was always the browser that always really went for standards com uh, compliance. Even Opera. Opera was a really, really big uh, uh, company to make the web what it is right now. And not many people give it credit for that. And it's kind of bizarre because it was always this like underdog browser. But it made a lot of things work the first time. Like that, especially in the CSS space that no other browser supported first. So our job was to actually chase implementations of new technologies and write very defensive code and say like, if that's a thing, then do that. If that's a thing, then do that. And the worst you can do was actually use the user agent and actually test, say like, okay, if user, uh, uh, if navigator dot, uh, dot Microsoft or navigator dot Firefox or navigator that, then do that and that was just uh, that's when you look at the user, user agents of browsers nowadays they actually have every other browser in there and that's for backwards compatibility and it was just because of those days where everything was different so when people are worried about differences in browsers nowadays i understand that this is an issue but most of the time it's a communication issue it's actually mm -hmm. not the case that we have a problem with browsers, all of them do a really good job already with, with things they do. There's annoying little things like doing a hundred VH gives you a little scroll bar on I, iOS Safari. and But these things are uh, changing much faster as well. The other pain back then was that browsers were a black hole. You had no idea who's working on them. You had no communication channels open to talk to them. And right. basically as a developer, you had to reverse engineer why something doesn't work. There was no documentation. There was no uh, no community outreach. Developer relations was not known for browser makers. It was just a thing that comes with the operating system or in Firefox case, it was the browser was the product, but it was product. It was not a community around it that actually asks for input, how to make the browser better. That just started in the last five years, I think, so to a degree in a really big scale. And right. before that, we basically we were at the uh, we were at the mercy of browser makers to do something. We could just complain about it. Social media wasn't big either yet, so we were, couldn't complain publicly. We just wrote our blog posts. But at the same time, I think it was interesting how it start how it started a lot of careers. Like my yeah. blog started as a scratch pad. When I found out how something works, I just wrote it down on my blog, and right. so I don't forget it myself. And that became basically the most successful blog post because people then later on found it when Stack Overflow started or these kind of things. And of course, Google 
promotes things that are old that have been uh, that have been verified for years and years so a blog that started in 2006 keeps showing up in things it's kind of frustrating when i try to look up something myself and then i find my own blog from 12 years ago because i had forgotten about it which happens frequently as well but it was it was it was a chaotic chaotic time it was really annoying that we didn't have standards but it's really painful to see how many people are now not fighting for standards, not fighting for standardization and say, like, you should just uh, put jQuery in the browser was a thing we had before. Now people say, like, why isn't React in the browser? And they're like, because they're all not standards. They're just solutions. They're software solutions yeah. that are not defined. They're basically, uh, they, they, they're, um, how do you say, how do they keep saying it's that they, they have their own ideas of how things should work and right, not how opinions. the web works and now the rendering systems work. So yep. uh, opinionated environments. And of course, opinionated environments are always easy to, to embrace and they're, they're easy to be successful really quickly, but they can become a barrier later on. And jQuery used to be very, very much needed. And again, it brought thousands of people into the market but nowadays it's actually becoming a performance problem. It's becoming a security problem, not because it's not maintained, but because the jQueries that are out there are 10, 12 years old and nobody maintains them any longer. Wow. So by abstracting the issues of the platform away from us, we made another barrier, we made, made another problem in here. And um, I'm, every browser maker is open nowadays. I mean, Safari, you can also five bucks against WebKit and yes, it, sometimes it takes uh, it takes a long time to answer because it's also not that we have thousands of engineers we can throw at a problem. We also have to maintain our workforce and uh, and align them to the needs of the browser as well. But we're living in a really really nice world where you can complain at the right places rather than just randomly complaining on social media and then wondering if people don't do anything about it. Yeah, the the rise of social coding has really changed the, the landscape. Um, but before we dive into the current state, because there's just a ton to, to talk about, can you take us all the way back to the young Chris? Uh, how did, what was your origin story in relationship to uh, information technology? How did you get started in computers and what got you into the world of programming? It started with, um with a Commodore 64 uh, computer, yeah. like a really old operating, uh, a really old home computer thing, which uh, uh, had BASIC in it, and uh, it, uh, of course, I, I, I had a paper round and made some money to actually get it, and then I badgered my parents until they gave me the rest of the money because I really needed to do my homework and to do their finances and stuff. And what I ended up doing was playing games, and I was really bad at playing games. And uh, <laughs> there was this there was this extension that you could buy, like a, a thing that went in the back of the computer. And then you could actually press a button and you could can make a copy of the game and put it in that other memory. And then you can start messing with the game there. So mm -hmm. one of the things it had was a poke finder, which uh, poke is the basic command to change a memory uh, item, uh, put a value in there. And basically it asks you like how many how many lives do you have now in the game then you lost a life and then how many lives do you have now and so on and so forth until it actually found out to give you endless lives and i love that because then i wasn't bad at the game anymore but then it also had a monitor in there which allowed you to disassemble the code to to do a disassembly of the assembly code of the of the program it was also possible to do pirated copies with it, but nobody ever did that. So that's not a feature that I ever looked at. Uh, but <laughs> the what I loved about that is that basically I analyzed the games to give myself endless lives, endless time, uh, uh, turn of collisions with enemies and stuff. And this is how I actually started to look at machine code. And then I went to the library and looked at machine code books and started writing code. And then I wrote some, some little uh, features for magazines and... Uh, then I basically uh, said, that's great, but it's a hobby. So mm -hmm. I, um, I went into radio instead. I worked at a radio station as a newscaster because that was the media at the time, 1994, 1993. And uh, there I then discovered the internet where we got access to uh, one of the first portals in Germany back then. And I was the first media in the city to actually get the news from the internet rather than waiting for the facts from the police office. And then I, start, I realized that's the same thing. Basically, the developer tools that you have uh, that not back then, but view source 
in the browser basically was the same bit that I did with disassembling that game and finding out how something works and how to mess with it. And that's exactly the same approach that I took to that one as well. So I learned HTML by looking at other websites, by looking at other uh, code that was available already on forums and mailing lists and these kind of things, and by changing numbers around until nothing breaks anymore. And then I actually realized, okay, this is how the web works as well. Everything that is on screen, I can mess with and I can do something with. And you said earlier, the uh, after view source, we had uh, Firebug, which was an extension to Firefox and was the predecessor of all the developer tools that we have now in browsers. Yep. And that one is basically, it uh, was the first time you could in you could inspect the DOM and the changes. So basically not only the HTML that the page is, but also all the stuff that's generated by JavaScript after the page has loaded. So we, you were able to debug and to actually set breakpoints already and uh, do CSS editing live and see the changes live in the browser. And that one just wouldn't die. That's still around. And I mean, in Firefox, we had a big issue that like a lot of users were still using Firebug rather than using the developer tools because we we wanted to, uh, the original owner didn't maintain them anymore. We had one person in Mozilla that actually was looking at Firebug to keep the, the lights on, so to say. But we, we realized that having the developer tools in the browser itself was so much better than we. Uh, Mozilla, uh, um, Opera had like uh, Dragonfly as well. So that one actually gave you a lot of things uh, to inspect. There were a few JScript editors from Microsoft. And that's basically how I got into it. I looked at the I looked at other websites and then I basically had to go to hospital for a few weeks and I took a laptop with me, one of those with like a battery life of like two hours. And I wrote my first web page from scratch using the HTML standard document to learn what the different HTML bits are. And then the rest is basically how I got into the market. So that when a headhunter found me and I was one of the few people that said in Germany that I basically know HTML. So the first website I built was actually an explanation website how HTML works, again, for myself. And then uh, people found it and out of a sudden I was like, yeah, this is great. So uh, in English, the other ones I had were in German. The self HTML was a big resource back then. And uh, yeah, that's how I got into it. Then the headhunter connected me with BMW to build their intranet. And that was like the first contract that I got. And then I, from there on, it moved to the other agency that I said before and uh, my, my career started. So I think my career started by being ambitious and basically not uh, uh, taking in that I'm bad at computer games, but basically I can mess with computer games to make them until I'm good at them. And this is something that I keep that kind of idealism of like of like saying like, hey, if it's on the screen, I can do something with it is something that uh, that's been forming my whole career because I, I never thought that I, I think any any system that people use should also give them a chance to change the system to their needs. And as developers, that was always the case, but I don't think you should be a developer to be able to change the system to your needs. And this is why I got more into the DevRel stuff and also now into the developer tooling to build tools for not only developers, but for everybody to actually change the websites that they're, or the web apps that they're actually using to their uh, needs and requirements. What I hear is the story of a, a young Chris who was curious, but also yeah. adventurous. Um, and if we layer on the idea that you enjoyed, uh, as, as I learned when I uh, worked on my first manuscript, um, the aha moments, like, whoa, oh, that's how that works. Okay, great. Um, you also enjoy sharing that information with the world. Um, how does that tie, well, first, how did you get into the world of open source and how does your passion for learning and teaching tie into your involvement with, uh, with the open source movement? I think that's basically where it came from. I learned HTML because it was downloadable, because it was open and it was available, the documentation and the standard and to read it. And this is why I wanted to give back as well. So everything that I, uh, I mean, working in radio and working as a newscaster, I always like, okay, I find something, I give it to the world. It came natural to me. It was mm -hmm. always really hard to shut me up. And uh, uh, as my parents keep saying, and uh, the the thing, the thing with open source was basically like it's great because you give back, and also it's I mean the red bus problem is the classic one. Like basically, if I give my stuff out as open source, if I give out my texts as Creative Commons, anything can happen to me. I can tomorrow throw in the towel and say I don't want anymore, 
the stuff can live on and other mm -hmm. people can learn from it. And uh, the thing that inspired me most about open source in this case was that the great solutions that people come up with based on what you throw out there. Like instead of just uh, writing code and then I tried to write my own CMS like everybody did in PHP back then, full of horrible XSS mistakes and like insecurity issues. Um, and I didn't enjoy just answering people's questions all the time. I didn't enjoy getting requests from people and then telling them, oh, if you pay me something extra, then you get that feature. I found it much more interesting to throw the thing out as open source and let other people deal with these issues and uh, basically also change it to something that they need later on. I realized right. quite early on that like selling a software product is possible, but it's also quite a pain and it's more a marketing effort than anything else. But uh, releasing it as open source means you actually have much more fun coding it and you also have to be much more honest about it because it's publicly available. You cannot hide bad code in open source. Okay, if, it's, if it gets to a certain size, you can. But like before that, it, it, you're always at the scrutiny of the community out there. And that also means that you're learning from the knowledge of the community. Like people fix things for you that you might have, have thought of. I, I'm, I'm super excited when, for example, I get feedback from developers who are blind, who basically say like, hey, this is an issue that accessibility. I fixed it myself because your code is readable. And I'm like, this is incredible. How cool is nice. that that I didn't see? Or people translate it into Chinese or do like a right to left uh, Arabic Hebrew uh, implementation for you that you haven't thought of. So the whole idea of publishing with the with my radio background and uh, and always want and always being happy to to give talks in school and these kind of things as well, or being a theater group and these kind of things, all tied into the open source idea. To me, open source is like it's code, but it's it's also eighty percent community work, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's incredible how many people think like you can throw sh uh, code out. And I mean, I kind of said that right now, so that was back then. But uh, uh, the the whole like the I call it I call it farm sourcing. Like we don't want to maintain a product anymore, so we throw it out as open source and we bring it to the farm, and it's all going to be great, and everybody anybody will take care of it, but us. And that doesn't work. Like the right. the uh, I think the sad story about open source to a degree is that it is a lot of effort and it is a lot of work and the huge open source projects are all maintained by large companies and actually a lot of money being spent on it with uh, with uh, uh, people's work time and people's efforts and documentation and writing all these things all of this stuff costs money so the uh, the the saying open source is free it's always the open source is free as in puppy like you have a puppy but you have to look at it and you have to feed it and you have to and sometimes it shits in your flat and there's nothing they can do about it but it's still the, the moments when it's actually I mean, it's actually cuddly and, and funny, then it's great to have. And uh, open source is a lot of work, but it also means that anybody who works in it uh, has a public uh, footprint already. So when I, uh, when I push for all the stuff that I do right now to be open source, I do that uh, because I want my engineers to also have a footprint later on. So if they leave the company after two years being in a Microsoft, Yahoo or whatever, I want them to be to have something public that they can show that they worked on for this huge company. It's frustrating when you go to job interviews and people say like, oh, you've been at Microsoft for five years. What have you done? And you're like, I can't show anything because it was all internal. And right. you then have to hope that uh, or you have to trust the person that they've done something amazing and you have to do silly uh, code exercises in the interviews and stuff. Whereas like if you worked on open source, it does not only show that you're already working on the code, it also there's a track record that you can publish code in an environment that actually is kind of hard to publish in, but it also shows how you can deal with community feedback. So right. when I look at people's GitHub uh, repos, when I try to hire them, I actually look much more into how they reacted with bad feedback, with good feedback, how they actually uh, uh, took in other people's pull requests and helped them out if they weren't at the right quality level rather than looking at the quality of the code itself. And I mean, um, other people don't do that, but I think it's, this is how you build a maintainable uh, product and also maintainable community. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head when it, you mentioned op uh, open source isn't free or free open source isn't free. Um, <laughs> I think people misconstrue 
the word free to be on both ends of the value chain. It may be free、mm. to use, but it wasn't free to create. Time essentially is the currency and energy, of course, that is being spent by volunteers. And then you layer that on top,、uh, you lay on top of that the corporations, which we'll get to in, in, in a little bit,、uh, investing you know, billions of dollars、uh, globally to not only create the open source tools and the web standards that we have today,、um, but Also, create a massive ecosystem that essentially could be construed as its own industry. W- what is that feeling like when developers reach out to you and say, Chris, thank you. Thank you for helping me? It's the best. I mean, it's also, I mean, even more, I think it's great to see people grow around you. Like when you get engineers who basically、uh, start. Communicating with other people on GitHub repos, start giving presentations, start actually、uh, sharing with other people and communicating with other people, and also get the the opportunity from the company to communicate out there. And you see them, their self confidence increases, they're they're getting better at their job, they're actually better in meetings, and they're better in like renegotiations of their salary as well because of it, because they 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 took the step of getting out in public. I think it's also、right. uh, it's also sad when it when it backfires and people don't get successes and people want to force the success. A lot of the open source successes that I had were were kind of accidental. The, the things that I I throw a lot of stuff out and not everything sticks. Almost eighty percent of it doesn't, but the ten percent, twenty percent, they kind of make make it worthwhile. And it's great to meet people. Who actually have a career or started a completely different career and got sideways into IT because of the stuff that I published? May it be the books or may it be the code that they worked on?、Um, I remember one time I had an interview、uh, and the engineer came in and we, we back then gave them a website to build and asked them to explain to us why. How they made different decisions, how to build the things that we showed them,、mm-hmm. which was a, which was a, a Photoshop mockup. And、uh, the guy came in and he basically. He took all the code out of my book, and he didn't know that I was the interviewer. So he came in and he was like <laughs> as white as the wall, and、uh, and I'm I'm sitting there and I'm like, well, I kind of look familiar that code.、Um, how did you like the code and how would you improve it? And he basically he understood the code. He actually there's nothing wrong with using open source or other people's solutions if they're legally you can use them and you could in my case because、right. the license allowed it and. That person understood what they were doing. They were just implementing it and using it. So I hired him because this is exactly what a good engineer should do. Like they should find a, already a solution, understand it, and implement it. If they just randomly incl-、uh, implement 600 npm packages without knowing what they're doing, that's a different story. But、uh, seeing that that we that back then it was much easier to build on those things, I think it was a great、uh, it was a great feeling to see somebody also being confident enough in that meeting then to not completely fall apart. But the seeing people grow around you with the stuff that you give out is is a wonderful thing. Of course, it all accelerated too fast in the past. I mean, like back then. YUI, for example, had a new version every half year or something.、Mm-hmm. And nowadays, every time you do a node install, you have six thousand packages that need updating. So the when you said earlier, it's free to use. It also the maintenance is a big part of it. You also need to、right. be need to have a system in place to keep the open source project that you're using up to date, so they're not becoming a security issue or a performance issue over time. That's something a lot of people. Don't think about and don't think that a need of an investment it is because it's still cheaper than buying a software off the shelf and actually not being able to use the functionality and wait for the next feature to come. But it is something you have to consider. And、uh, the other thing, of course, is when you get really successful nowadays with with、uh, with open source, it can become too quick and people can be super overwhelmed with the amount of feedback that they get. The、uh, the magical community that builds around an open source project. Is is really getting scarcer and scarcer. Like back in the days, a lot of people were YUI fans, a lot of people were jQuery fans, and helped other people out when they were questioning things. Nowadays, with the whole rockstar developer thing going on, like an open source project becomes really successful, the one developer who did it is then completely overwhelmed, and you see so many times that after three months, projects become unmaintained or need to get bought by a certain company and put a lot of people on it. To actually keep it alive, because the single person who actually built it 
and gave it out to public uh, actually opened the genie in the bottle and didn't realize just how much work it is to have a really successful open source project and how many demands are coming out from the outside world. Yeah, you, you touch on a very interesting subject here where open source maintainers, or excuse me, yeah, the, the, the creators of open source tools that go gangbusters are not looking to craft, at least if money isn't the thing that they're trying to shoot for, the goal, but typically they're trying to solve a problem. I've talked to quite a number of open source uh, community founders, and they all pretty much said the same thing. I'm in it to solve a problem. And they hit a certain inflection point. I imagine if we were to do a retroactive study of, let's call it the top 20, top 50, uh, most uh, sought out open source fra uh, frameworks, even in JavaScript specifically, or if you want to open it up to the entire world of open source, you, you see a certain point where the community hits uh, almost like a friction point. It's like there's so much work to maintain it that you start to need to have to delegate as an open source cr creator um, the, the activity of maintaining just the community communications, PRs, questions, uh, you know, making sure that you actually have a place for people to chat, Discord server, you know, community con contribution guidelines. And once you hit that point, the open source creator doesn't have the time if they're not delegating appropriately which isn't a skill that comes naturally to many people, they hit a point where they're just not able to do the thing that they love doing, which is coding and solving the problem. Um, ha have you met anyone who's run into that problem? And you know, do you have any solutions on how to fix that? Many, I think this is also, you're describing just our general career as developers. At a certain level, you're actually being asked to run into, go into management, to go into product management or something, because there's just, you should scale to other people and you're becoming too expensive and too much of a liability if you're the only person who knows about something. And that's when the community building kind of comes in as well. In the open source space, you have to do it for your own like peace of mind because otherwise you're being overwhelmed by the community that doesn't pay you anything. In a company, right. it's a different story because at least you get paid. But the uh, the scaling of that is almost impossible to, to fathom. It's the same with like, People, uh, CEOs of companies or CTOs of companies that build a great software product and then get bought by a large corporation, um, your coding days are over. You basically, if, if, if there's a certain amount of millions in the play, you're going to be in meetings. You're going to be in like uh, definitions with other people, how your product will integrate with the rest of the company that bought you. Uh, you're not going to be the coder for the next year until you do your three years waiting for your shares and then to vest and then go out and code the next thing or do it in your free time. And I think that's actually quite a healthy thing because the whole like side hustle and like building the next product and the next product and next product is uh, is kind of not healthy. It's it's a very much like a, uh, a I don't know, uh, uh, like astronaut of the 50s or like investment banker of the 80s thing. Like it's these high pressure environments that are the coolest and most intelligent and most successful people. And there's nothing more boring to me out there than this kind of uh, uh, attitude. So uh, when the certain moment hit, then uh, uh, there's two ways of doing it. Other, some people just throw in the towel and basically say like, here's the code, do whatever you want with it. These products mm -hmm. hardly ever survive unless they got a corporate sponsor up in between. And the other people are basically just scaling down and getting more into like a benevolent overlord of the product rather than like the maintainer of it. So their job is to find other people who can maintain the code, find out, get those PRs in and see the people who are actually really changing the core and co and share also the success with them. So if your open source project makes money, then you also should share with the community and the people that actually contribute to it. That's a, that's a great way to make it more scalable, to make uh, to make it possible that for you to actually not be overwhelmed. But that inflection point of that magical community is uh, is a very interesting thing to see. It kind of feels to me um, also that when a certain open source project becomes very successful and becomes a commercial success, then people take uh, the hardcore people of the open source community don't commute don't contribute to it anymore. It reminds right. me of like in the punk scene when you're like, you, you, you're going to see that punk band in every pub that they're playing and then they've got the first record out and then like, oh, they're commercial now. I'm not going to deal with them any longer. And you're like, 
well, they have to make a living, you know, like why is right. it, why can't you allow people to grow and, and change into something else? So the, uh, the like commercialization of open source is something that is tricky because you don't want to be uh, seen, you, you, you don't feel like a, a, an appreciated contributor if somebody else makes a lot of money with the stuff that you do and you don't. That's why it's tricky for large corporations to have open source projects as well. So when I ask people what they want from the dev tools and the code is available from the extension that I'm working on, uh, there's no contributions from the outside because people just expect Microsoft to have 50 developers who are just bored in the corner and we can throw them at any project if we want to. We don't. The team is like six people and now it's two people because we, the other four people are working on the next thing that we're working on. So uh, we need outside help, even as large corporations, if in the open source project and we also validate the quality of an open source project by how much outside engagement we get and mm -hmm. if uh, people don't contribute because there's a big corporate name on it then then there's a problem because then you shouldn't be surprised if the commercial pro company did ditches that open source project in one or years two years time because it doesn't feel like a success unless the company is very much dependent on the product, like the Reacts of this world or the Node.js of this world kind of thing. Right. So um, it's very hard to, to make sure that everybody feels appreciated that contributes to your product. But it's also very important that people understand that the maintainers, even commercial companies, have people in there fighting tooth and nail to keep the thing alive and to get resources to actually make it happen. So uh, when when somebody says like, okay, company X now bought this product, this open source product, this means it's maintained for the rest of the rest of life. It isn't. It's still an open source right. product that grew as an open source product and needs still uh, contribution from the outside. Yeah, in business parlance, open source essentially is a cost center. Um, very yeah. rarely does open source itself. It, it might be part of critical infrastructure. Uh, Bazel, for example, at Google, part of critical infrastructure, but it's never going to generate revenue. It enables uh, other products to be built faster and, and more reproducibly, but it doesn't actually generate uh, money. Likewise, React doesn't generate money for Facebook, nor does uh, the dev tools, I guess, for Microsoft. Um, sustainability has been a topic of discussion for over the past decade when it comes to, to open source. I know that there are lots of companies and nonprofits like um, the Open Source Collective. I, I got a chance to meet Pia Mancini uh, a number of years ago, who's working hard to solve this and create a platform for open source maintainers to actually get some sort of income so that they can fund and maintain their, their, their open source tools. What other challenges do you think uh, the open source communities today are facing? I think the uh, when it comes to that, uh, it's even worse with Creative Commons or with like art in itself and like things that people put on the internet. I mean, uh, memes like the, the the this is fine dog. This was a graph. That this was a comic artist. It was part of a comic. He doesn't see any penny of millions of people using that every single day. So right. the, the 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 there's no feedback channel there. I think is a very very annoying thing about it that like you you can give out things for free and you should uh, you should actually it's interesting when you said like react doesn't make any money and it just came to my head that people do make money with react though like they, they do. not only That's by correct. building software but also training companies like uh, video courses youtube people a lot of the, right. uh, a lot a lot of times and that, that never occurred to me that much how many people you empower of to make money with training people on your product that you That's don't correct. even know about that basically is is a different uh, model in there as well. I mean, the, the, when we talked about the developer evangelism book, I mean, I gave that out for free on the internet. I wrote it in PHP in the beginning, and now I wrote it in Markdown and actually made it, put it on GitHub. And um, yeah, I just started putting that on Amazon. Uh, well, somebody asked me if there's an EPUB of it, and I'm like, nah, there isn't. But he's like, okay, so I'm gonna build it. And I'm like, sure, course, course code is there, go for it. And uh, now we put it on LeanPub, we put it on Amazon, and people buy it. And I'm confused, but I'm happy that they buy it. I mean, it's like twenty dollars in three months, so I'm not I'm not retiring yet. But uh, it's still interesting that commercial offerings still work. Some people want yes. to pay for things, and I do the same. I mean, I pay about 
a hundred dollars a month on Patreon for different products and mm -hmm. uh, different media outlets that I support and that I enjoy watching, I enjoyed reading. And also um, one of them is the uh, caniuse.com website that actually yep. analyzes everything on the web. And that's like, that's a coffee for me. And I'm fine to, I'm happy to support that. But yeah, real sustainability of those things and the efforts that you put in is is tricky to uh, to monetize. And it's also something that you don't want to think about when you do it. As I said before, you, you want to solve a problem. And then when you solve the problem, you you don't have any problem staying up late at night fixing the latest little detail of that problem. But after five years of solving that problem and not seeing any money come in, and except for a lot of abuse coming in or people telling you you're not fast enough in new features or their feature request is the most important one over the others, it can get right. super frustrating. And uh, the when it comes to the foundational work, what Mozilla is doing, what the Open Source Foundation is doing, what uh, the, the, the JavaScript Foundation is doing. I think there's a lot of stuff out there, but it's um, it's tricky. And it's also interesting how some of these things change over the years. Like, um, I mean, some foundations make a lot of money and they have a commercial side to them as well. And it doesn't, the money doesn't go back, back to the community that they originated from. And that's yeah. another big thing that is problematic there. I guess we just get rid of money and that then we wouldn't have, have a problem. We get the whole Star Trek thing. I think the biggest thing to do is to, to find other people to contribute to your product and hand right. over quickly as well. Like say like, okay, I'm, I've done it. I've created it. Here's five younger people, hungry people, interested people that actually want to maintain it. I promote them to actually be the maintainers of it and I step back and do something different or I just step back as a mentor as or as a last contributor or last push push the, the the builds out or whatever but it's really tough to do that once you're actually uh solved the problem that you had and then created a product from it and then it became really successful and you want to pull out as quickly as you can to to become a mentor for a community rather than that. And of course, this doesn't scale because there's probably 6,000 open source projects that all need a community. And right. nobody wants to be a professional community member because that doesn't pay either. So that's where it gets tricky. Well, yeah, yeah I, I, the, the challenge is, uh, to, well, first to be clear, yes, tools like Facebook, excuse me, tools like React do not generate revenue itself for Facebook. But when they go gangbusters, just like you said, they essentially create microeconomies or economies of scale where other companies can do things in the name of using the tool, but they don't funnel that value, money, back to the open source community. Now, in, in the case of a large company like Facebook, that's logical because Facebook itself funds it. Now, you can contribute mm. in other ways. For example, you can sponsor a conference, a community event. Maybe uh, you can add value by creating knowledge sharing, which we've done quite a bit, all of that. Um, but it, it, you see most of that problem occur when you have <laughs> grassroots open source. It's, it's an interesting, complicated story or problem to try to solve. Um, and you know, I, I do want to hone in on this boot camp thing because I can recall circa 2000, maybe 2013, 2014, I'm interviewing someone um, around the world of JavaScript. And I look personally for people who are curious, like I, if I can say we are, where if we're going to use the technology, we want to understand how it's working, not just how to implement uh, or, or solve a problem with the technology. And I talked to this individual and they said, uh, I asked them about JavaScript and they could not understand, explain how to create uh, what, what uh, the dot prototype object is, you know, object uh, oriented principles and whatnot with JavaScript. To them, jQuery itself was JavaScript. Mm -hmm. And I asked them where they started learning programming and essentially it was a bootcamp. And so I start to see this trend where the bootcamps themselves are teaching you the bare minimum, but not necessarily giving you the, the way the ways in how to think like an engineer. How have you seen boot camps contribute to uh, problems within the open source world? They're good. I mean, like they're, they're especially free boot camps. These great right. get people that actually come sideways into the market and just want to try something out. I think there are a lot of them are snake oil that basically just tells you like, oh, after this, you're going to get a job at Facebook. Like after the you paid like three thousand dollars for that two week course, you're going to you're going to get a, a huge job in IT. 
and uh, uh, not the case in 99% of the cases. It could happen, but it's. Uh, I think that's also uh, to a larger problem. Like, how do we how do we get the next uh, the next generation of developers to actually embrace the idea that you have to understand what you're doing? Because we're building on on component component on framework on framework on framework jQuery was just one of them. I mean, uh, React is going to be the next one because there is web components that work without React, but they're not right. completely compatible with React components. So people do different things. And then another person comes up with another framework that actually wants to do something slightly different because it's so much better than the standard. And then we, 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 we have another dependency there. Um, I don't want to just say that, uh, uh, that that boot camps are terrible and that they actually lead to lots of bad developers. I'm actually more, uh, I, I want to turn this around. I'm actually more annoyed how the people in the world of development don't care about sharing with the educational part of it. Hmm. We don't go to universities and give talks. We don't go to, to, to reach out to boot camps and say like, this is actually terrible. Why don't you do it that way? We don't help them with their curriculum to make it better. Of course, they're commercial companies, but at the same time, if you really care about it, this is where people learn wrong things. And once you learn the wrong thing, you will never unlearn it. That's the biggest issue. I got a full request today or an issue today on GitHub on the browser uh, that we have inside Visual Studio Code. And people said, oh, it's not working for them because alert doesn't work. And I'm like, what do you use alert for? And he's basically, well, for debugging. And that's the only way he, he knows how to debug because he learned it in a boot camp. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, who in 2022 teaches people alert for debugging when there is a console everywhere? And there is basically a debug, great debugging tools built into the browser. But we, every language that we, every language tutorial that I see out there starts with a print command of some sort. And the right. print command of JavaScript was the alert. And it's still out there, and it's still that uh, uh, that people come with this half knowledge. Then, and if it's a good teacher or a good salesperson, they come up with a really great feeling of like, I know this now. I can build these things. Question is like, do you do? Does somebody really need to understand the prototype? Uh, does it, the prototypical inheritance? Does does everybody who builds things on the web actually need to know the the how things work under the hood in terms of the language, or but would it be more interesting to see what impact what they use have like so you use jquery now with that this means somebody maintaining that also needs to know jquery right. like this is uh, uh, like any teaching that we do should be the bare bones technologies that actually shows you how to use it and that's where i get excited about the how css turned out to be now like it does so many things and it, it became so complex, which is annoying to a degree. But at the same time, you can show people in like two lines of CSS that they don't need to use that JavaScript framework because the animation can be done that way, for example. Right. So um, I, I think the the idea of boot camps is just, I mean, you can't fight it. That's basically like every job has that. There's all these like, I mean... Marriott hotels are basically made for these kinds of sales things where people stand and tell people you can become your own uh, uh, real estate agent in two days if you take my course. You can be a public speaker, although you don't know anything about the subject matter if you, if you follow these five, seven rules kind of thing. So um, I think we need more people in our market. There's still a massive gap of workforce, especially in outside America and in other places. And uh, but we we need people to to not have to re-educate them when they when they come into the company or or structure it. So I don't want to say uh, that boot camps and like these fast track things made the JavaScript world messier. I actually think it's time for us to actually think about that as well. Like again, how do we make ourselves sustainable? How do we make that market sustainable? And I think we do that by partnering more with the educational side of it rather than just building yet another library that tells people that they don't need to learn it. They don't need to understand it. And one of the big successes of any product right now is telling people use this and everything works. And I think that's a message we should stop saying as well as main t uh, as creators of these things. That it's just like, oh, I use this to solve these, to work around these issues is a better story than right. saying like, just use this and you don't need to think about anything because you always need to think about a lot of stuff. That reminds me of the story of the low code, no code solutions out there. <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> well, I mean, you don't need to learn how to code. You just learn more tool. Yeah. yeah. What you see is what you get has always been a good dream. And I think it is actually very close. If I look yeah. at Figma, if I look at things, what we can do in the browser nowadays, that be that becomes not just a click through, but there is actually turn it into components, uh, uh, create React components from Figma designs. It's all possible, especially using machine learning and using like analysis yep. of the things in the background. I think we're at an interesting uh, 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 cha changing point in our market right now, where what you see is what you get or like dragging things together is not the horrible code uh, uh, creation that it was in the past. I remember Dreamweaver and these kind of things. It was great to, to basically do that. The problem was that the DOM is not meant to be a canvas. It's meant to be a document. And right. that's where, where we had a lot of problems with what you see is what you get in the past. But I think the tooling has become quite interesting. And I, I also think that not everybody has to become a developer. If it comes to publishing things on the web, creating an app, especially those apps that are basically meant to just be a hype for like a few weeks. Right. Why would anybody want to code them? You could click them together right. and that'll be fine by me too, because these things are meant to vanish. Whereas like, like if yeah, they, temporary. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody, nobody made, uh, uh, made Flappy Bird uh, enterprise uh, uh, product. <laughs> and it doesn't make sense to actually, uh, to actually say, oh, the code is unmaintainable. And you're like, yeah, it's meant to be. It's just a fun thing that's supposed to be around for a few months. And that's about it. So I think the no code and low code thing is great to bring more people into our market that actually can create things. And if they can focus on building wonderful things and build, building uh, solutions that solve people's problems, then I'm totally up for them. The only problem that I see with that is like a lot of frameworks, a lot of design, uh, design frameworks as well, a lot of component frameworks. Um, don't create good things. They create lots of diffs and spans with like lots of classes on them, but they're not accessible. They're not maintainable. Sometimes they don't even allow for for just enough content. I mean, every design that I ever got from somebody, I translate it back into German and send it back to them because basically German needs about one and a half times space that English does. So okay. if it doesn't work with that, then it's not a web thing. So um, a lot of frameworks out there are basically just showing the, the happy path and low code right. solutions as well. They basically just build things for you that look great, but then don't work when a certain thing can't be met. So when it comes to the real coders, the real developers out there, the real engineers out there, they should be in those companies and make sure that what's being generated is actually sensible and not just easy. And uh, I mean, it was interesting. There was this conference in London right now called Modern Front Ends that dot info and the website was done in, with wix.com and uh, uh, i mean i love the idea of wix.com that anybody can build a website but if you do a product that says like oh best practices of the web and you build it with wix.com and has like 1400 errors on the first page then there is a problem and uh, that's of course a communication issue i guess but uh, it's interesting i love thinking more about low code and no code solutions but as an engineer to build them to create sensible things, not to make right. sure that people can just flood the web with more terrible products out there. Yeah, the, I mean, yes, the goal of no code, low code is to increase accessibility. I mean, if we think about um, Steve Jobs and why he decided to copy Xerox's UI and build the first Mac, you know, his whole point was to make it so that the everyday human could actually use a computer because we had DOS and green screen terminals back then. Today, you know, in yeah. the web, yes, no code, low code does increase accessibility. But with that comes, I think, the the distance, how far you can take an application, the complexity depth, isn't as 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 a, a possible as if you were to have an engineer. I mean, computers are inherently complicated machines, and you know, as as we look at the technologies we use to build web applications. Essentially, if, if you were to map everything down from the JavaScript you write to the interpreter to the browser, the DOM, blah, 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 all the way down, like we start to see like this massive pyramid of, of technologies, open source and proprietary alike. And, and it's actually amazing to see that any of this actually works at all when you get you know, to look at that one big view. Have you used Copilot before, by the way? Um, yeah, of course. It's, it's, it's nearing a, a year, okay. Yeah, so Copilot is nearing a year in, 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 in the uh, public space. Have you been able to use it? What are your thoughts on it? 
I'm a huge fan of it. I think it's it, it is it is to me the future of development, because I mean, if we go to Stack Overflow and copy and paste something back into our code, or if the code editor does it for us, that's the same thing. It actually it is it is a much better space uh, to let the code editor do it because then you can, then you can also do analysis of the code while you inject it. You could say if there's performance issues, if there's security issues in it. That's not happening right now, and I think that's something that the the co-pilots of this world or Code Whisperer from Amazon and other editors out there that actually do the same thing right now are going into. Uh, I think it's a really exciting moment. I mean, I uh, I'm. What I like most about it is it is not what people think it is. People think Copilot is like, okay, I type something in a function name and it gets me a function from the internet and I paste it in. It actually analyzes everything around you. So when I use Copilot and I used it for the, almost a year now, uh, it mimics my programming style as well. So I basically, mm. it, it generates functions that really are like I would have written them. And I'm not I'm not saying that I'm writing perfect code and I'm the best solution that could have could, could find, but I like that a lot that it it finds context. I mean, I the other day I wrote an, uh, an HTML table just a header row, and then I had a JavaScript array, and it generated the rest of the HTML from that array. And the array was not in the same order as the table. It actually realized from the values in that array what order that should write that in. And that's the really clever stuff about it. The other thing I love about Copilot is that you can highlight a piece of code and say, explain to me what that is. And it actually tries, it does a really good job of explaining it to you. I did it with Java developers that basically hate CSS and I, I highlighted CSS and then the English explanation, what the CSS does, they're like, oh, that's why that's such a weird percentage number. I didn't know that this is actually doing that. And I love that it that the, the, the between natural language processing and code is basically broken with uh, with GitHub Copilot. It's interesting how um, how it brings out the uh, the 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 worst com communication problems and like again a large company using it. Uh, and there's this court case now against GitHub uh, uh, Copilot that it kills your community out of the box. And uh, I can't comment on that. I, I I don't know about licenses. I'm really bad at that. Uh, and there's also a white paper that I saw yesterday. It's like, does GitHub Copilot and others make more insecure code? And they interviewed right. people and they said like, okay, they trust the code more if it comes from Copilot, although it's not validated. And I'm like, yeah, people are lazy, duh, I could have told you that. <laughs> so I really want this to take the next level that basically it needs a linting while it's actually implementing it. It really needs to flag up issues that are happening there. And I'm working with uh, with GitHub on that. And I am I would love to actually work full-time on Copilot, but that's not in the, in the books at the moment. But I think that is really, really what I wanted the interface, that what programming was about to a degree. I mean, I always hated that in like enterprise languages like C Sharp and Java that you had all this boilerplate code that basically I'm like, why do we keep writing this? Like this should be just out of the box already in there. This is like a getter and setter for everything that you do. Writing that by hand makes no sense to me. Right. And uh, I love that, for example, you can write a, uh, um, you can say, I need a regular expression for this and that and Copilot would generate for it. Because to me, I came from Perl to PHP, so regular expressions are readable, but that's other people say uh, uh, Tolkien's languages are easier than English, which is kind of the same uh, comparison. But I really like that that the the human aspect of uh, GitHub Copilot is the interesting bit. I gave a talk about this as well, where I compared. No, I wrote a blog post about that, where I compared it to uh, cruise control in the car. I just had a, I just had, had to buy a new car because my old one died, and uh, for the first time. Before that, it was all manual. Like uh, I still have a manual gear because that's what to do. But uh, there was no computer in the car at all that we had before. And now everything is like controlled and I hated it. I'm like, why does this steering wheel start vibrating when I'm not in the middle of the lane? Like, why does it tell, keep telling me that I do that? But then I realized cruise control is like, hey, I could drive eight hours at 130 kilometers an hour without having to press the pedal and actually as it is annoying for me that the thing vibrates, I stay more in the middle of the lane than I did before. So that's right. where I see these coming in as well. I think the the uh, uh, machine learning on uh, on on generated uh, uh, code 
is a very, very exciting market to get in. And there's this tool that I saw yes, uh, last week that I got access to called layman.ai. And that one allows you to copy and paste text in and get it in simple terms. So mm -hmm. you can paste like uh, contracts in there. I pasted my job description in there. So I finally understood what I'm supposed to do. And of course, the legalese of it was just incomprehensible to me. And this one was a really interesting way to distill it down to the need. I think what the... Uh, what the code completion with machine learning does and CodePilot does really well is not just generate code for you, but also give you more context about the code that you write. And this is where it gets really interesting. And uh, again, like why would you be, be happy to write the same amount of code over and over? A lazy developer is a good developer. We always find ways to reuse things. Those were snippets. Those were like libraries. Those were things we kept imp implementing and using there. And now the, the editor does that for you on the fly, which is an interesting thing. The missing point uh, that I really think we should be uh, uh, increasing now is the quality control, that it actually should be parsed with, with a linter and actually flagged up uh, uh, as a bad solution. But that doesn't happen on the open web either. Like on Stack Overflow, right. the first result is not the best code. It's the most yep. simple code and it's the most uh, people found it easiest to understand. It doesn't mean that it's actually the best code. So we need, again, artificial intelligence, machine learning to actually look at the vulnerabilities, the issues and the performance issues of that code as it is injected. But uh, I think it's, it's a great way to actually... Um, to find a, a code standard for a team as well as it analyzes what i'm how i'm writing my code and other people in the team are writing their code it probably could generate a web st a, a code standard for you from just usage of uh, of something like github copilot for over uh, right. over a few months and uh, yeah code standards are impossible to implement and to come up with that everybody is excited about but as it when it gets generated from how people write code anyways that would be an interesting way to uh, to get teams more efficient that way as well. We've been looking at Copilot for quite a number of months now, and uh, I, I was first excited when uh, I'm looking at Rust. I've been learning it and using a UI toolkit called eGUI, or it's a immediate mode framework. And uh, I was surprised that as soon as I said, "Okay, let me let me try something different." Okay, JavaScript, HTML, CSS, Copilot could handle that no problem. I thought, "Let me just throw a curveball at this thing." And I created a function stub, a name called create blue button. And it legitimately crafted out the actual contents of the function to return an instance of this eGUI button stylized with blue coloring. And <laughs> it seems like such a simple thing, but I was like, a blue button. How does this AI know exactly what to do? And it knew it. And then internally, uh, we have quite a few folks who uh, have, have been using Copilot for a number of months now as well. And uh, I heard the most remarkable comment about Copilot that I, I have yet to hear. And this gentleman said he feels less tired when using Copilot. Yep. Less mental energy is, is, is used when he's working on his tools and, and software. And I just thought that was like just such an awesome thing to hear. Um, Chris, as, as I learn more about you today, I, I hear the story about someone who's humble, who's not afraid about uh, to, to share information and help uh, others be successful. Um, how does Chris, how do you define success for yourself? Um, I think success to me is uh, being able to actually have my life and do the things that I do want, that I want to do. And so far, I've been really successful in this case that basically I've seen when I wrote something and I did it because I wanted to, it became successful. People read it, it inspired other people. I think uh, uh, inspiring other people to become better and to do better or inspiring other people to just start something and be less fearful and to, to, to trust themselves to do something they haven't done before. That's the thing that I think is really, really making me happy. And that ha own happiness, I think, is success. Um, in terms of like uh, career wise and stuff, I'm actually at a point where I'm uh, where I'm uh, where I'm starting to I'm writing a few things about that right now. It's our system is kind of broken that it always expects people to want to get a promotion and want to get more shares every year. 
and mm-hmm. to actually go into a place where they are uh, uh, where you constantly have to improve in terms of your uh, in terms of where yourself are what your job title is and how much money you have in the bank uh, we don't actually have a system that supports people that are just saying like you know what my pyramid is full and I have all the things that I need now I want to share more with other people and I want to actually make uh, uh, make other people around me successful and see if they can get better but you don't you normally don't get the chance to lead other people unless you have a certain job title and unless you have a certain amount of money on the bank as well and people look up to that as success I don't think rich people are successful I think most rich people really rich people inherited most of the money that they actually have they 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 already grew up into a rich world mm-hmm. I didn't I mean I'm I'm very happy with the money that I have right now I'm I'm from a background of of, of coal miners and factory workers I'm the first one who went to high school in my whole in my whole uh, uh, in my whole family and I think the success is basically to me uh be, not being tired of working not being tired to do right. your job as you said with your colleague this is a very good point that basically you want to do what you're doing and you can live with it you you have enough to get by you have enough to buy a new car if need be or to pay your rent or pay your heating and uh, as soon as this certain level is reached then i think success is more seeing how you inspire others and how you how others around you grow rather than you yourself doing something different and being able to to sleep well and say like you know what i don't want to work today I, I need a day off and you get a day off. That's another thing to be at that level that people trust you to to take a day off and be back again. That's another interesting right. uh, success factor as well. Um, I think I've done, I've done okay with my life. I'm really happy with what I've accomplished so far. I, I don't know what the future will bring. I mean, uh, I think in the long term, I probably want to have a, a coffee place on an island, have a few goats and a few dogs and basically write books in there and uh, only serve people that I want to serve. But that's something that I guess everybody has sooner or later, that dream. <laughs> but we'll see how it works out. Success is an interesting thing. I think uh, calmness and being okay with what you do and not feeling you should do more. Right. That's really when success comes in. Like when you, uh, it, of course, it's always good to be hungry, to want to improve, to do something better, to do more. But uh, chasing that uh, that idea of the successful you will not make you successful. It actually will make you compare yourself with something that you can't reach, much like people get jealous of their own Instagram account. That's a really bad idea because that one has a better life than them. Another big thing that I find keeps me the way it is, is that having a partner that has nothing to do with computers and hates computers and social media. It's really wonderful because, uh, I mean, really? I get people like, oh, my God, I follow you on Twitter. And she's like, what's that? Who cares? Like, this is a really, really good way to keep you grounded. And you're like, OK, I'm not as cool as I think people I people think I am. And uh, it, it's really good to just go out and talk to normal people and not just stay in that bubble because it's really easy to get high on your own supply here. And it's not a good idea. You mentioned about humble beginnings, and I, we actually share that. I am the first in my generation uh, to graduate high school. Uh, My own parents didn't go past eighth and ninth grade. And um, I I would say that we're very fortunate, you and I, to be able to work in a career where we actually enjoy what we do um, and are surrounded. We actually work to surround ourselves with people who enjoy what what they do as well. And uh, you have, by all measures, uh, have an absolutely fantastically successful career. How would you suggest uh, professionals uh, get involved in the open source movement? Look at the, the open source product that you want to use, go to the repository and start contributing. This could be just fixing a typo. This could be just documenting something that you found that basically, uh, it's interesting when people use something and they don't know how to use it and then they go to the com- uh, go to the GitHub repo and say like, oh, this uh, can someone document that or this is not documented. I don't know what's do- what you're doing. The, 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 uh, I mean, I get about 700 feedback items a day on, on things on Microsoft and 80% of them is rubbish. That basically makes no sense. Uh, but also what, what hurts me more is that of the 5% that come in that are sensible, the language, how people ask for help is horrible. 
-hmm. like people just give you like throw you like oh this doesn't work and not more like what did they do what how did it didn't work how did it how did it, why doesn't it work what what is your setup kind of thing we get no information about that it's just like you should do this and uh, no I, I cannot act on that i'm sorry so uh going to a repo and becoming a good uh, uh becoming taking a look around and say like okay here's an issue that i encountered or say like hey this is a problem that i have right now i'm happy to uh, if anybody can tell me how to solve it I could contribute some documentation back how I learned how to fix it. So that will be a great way to actually get started. And that even works with social media. Just like, I mean, as I said, my blog is a scratch, po a scratch pad for me to write about things that I want to remember. And social media can be the same thing. Like, hey, did you know React has this thing and here's how to use it? And just go out there and start the communication part. You don't. You shouldn't feel bad if you're not a good developer, or if a great developer, or you think like you can contribute to React Core or to the Chromium Core. You probably can't, but that doesn't mean you cannot be a part of that community. It means that you can basically help with documentation. You can help with just typos. You can help with making a screenshot that they didn't have on a on another operating system that they don't have access to. So all of these ways to contribute with the uh, with the open source world out there. And um, it's interesting, again, that just came to me. This is how it started back then, back in the long, long ago with us as well. We had mailing lists and this is how we shared information. Mm -hmm. And you didn't go on the mailing list and basically became like the, oh, fix my problem. You went there and you were happy that you were actually ac allowed to access it to see people like Zeltman right. and like people who'd write jQuery and those kind of people. And you then... You, you looked at it for a few months and, or for a few days or a few weeks, and then you started contributing. So um, taking in the documentation, taking in, uh, taking a look at the source code, how some things have been done and looking at, at, uh, at uh, discussions around the product is probably the best way to get involved. Chris, I cannot thank you enough for your time today. Um, for those of you who are not aware of this, I, I look up to you as a hero in the open source community, Chris. This is my first time <laughs> telling you this. Uh, it w I was quite nervous to reach out to you, and I'm grateful that you not only accepted uh, an invitation to just talk about being a part of the show, but you've given up so much of your time to share some really good insights. Um, you are a force to be reckoned with, dude, and uh, I, I hope one day to be able to be in the same physical space as you so that I could at least share, uh, give you a beer and or give you a hug if you're interested. For anyone looking to learn more about Chris, uh, I'm going to go ahead and put a bunch of links in the show, including his blog, the developer advocacy book. Please buy it and show your support for him. He published this thing quite a number of years ago. We internally shared it. And now that we have an opportunity to, to actually donate uh, and, and contribute some monetary funds to your work, uh, I'm excited about it. Well, thank you so much. This was great.